Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Fierce Founders Boot Camp Finale. I'm Lisa Cashmore, and I'm very excited to be hosting the event today. Supporting women entrepreneurs, women in STEM, and women in leadership has been a passion of mine for many years. We are making progress in the journey towards equality, but we aren't there yet. When I look at the portfolio of companies we serve, I'm not satisfied with the ratio of male to female founders. And when I dig deeper than that, I'm not satisfied with the leadership team dynamics. To put it simply, there are not enough women in leadership in our tech community. Programs and events like this are a step in the right direction. I've seen some incredible founders emerge from this boot camp with this cohort and with previous iterations. And I'm grateful to each and every one of you. You're making the path more clear for those like my daughter Addison that will come behind you. Stay tuned later this afternoon when we unveil some additional support that women founders can leverage in the growth stages of their businesses. Today is a pretty high stakes event. There's a grand total of $100,000 in startup funding up for grabs. Yes, yes, that's something to cheer about. We're in for a really special afternoon. During the Fierce Founders Boot Camp this winter, the women you are about to meet were given an intensive education about how to build a company. Over the past month, they've been working with business experts to refine their pitch deck and practice their presentation skills. There are 25 companies in the boot camp, and you're about to hear from the top eight pitches. This is a really exciting afternoon and the culmination of a lot of hard work. We would like to recognize all the women who've participated in the Fierce Founders Boot Camp. Please stand up. You all deserve a round of applause. <laughs> Programs like this one don't happen without support. We'd like to thank Fierce Founder Corporate Partners, BDC, and Google for Startups. Thanks also to, our federal, to the Federal Economic Development Agency of Southern Ontario and the Government of Canada. Because of their investments in helping companies start and scale, Communitech is able to execute this type of important programming to help entrepreneurs grow their companies and create jobs. We know that successful, sustainable companies are grounded in diverse ideas and teams. Our Fierce Founder Boot Camp is one of the ways we help women in our tech community advance in leadership roles. Before we get to the pitches for our eight finalists, I'd like to introduce our panel of distinguished judges. If you could give a quick wave when I say your name to show who you are, that would be great. Rebecca Toscona, Regional President, Southwestern Ontario for BMO. Danielle Graham, Principal at Dream Maker Ventures. Stephen Woods, Senior Director, Engineering at Google. And Amy Hastings, Legal Advisor. Now that we know who will be deciding the winner or winners of our amazing $100,000 prize, let's get the show on the road. Each company will get five minutes to pitch, followed by five minutes to answer questions from our judges. We ask that you please hold your applause until the end of each pitch. And we'll also have one last round of applause uh, after all of the pitches have been completed so that you can make sure you, everybody knows that you're super appreciative of all their hard work. So let's get the, ro the ball rolling, shall we? First up is Alicia McFetridge from Rainstick. Check, 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 hello, hello, hello. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay, great. 
from extreme drought in California to flooding in, um, in Alberta. Climate change is here and is having devastating impacts around the world. One of the most affected areas is water, and that's because it has so many uses. But despite our reliance on water, every time we use water, we waste it. I mean, think about when you shower. We heat up 100 liters of water, and then we let it touch our skin for only a second before it goes down the drain. This is wasteful. We waste 150 trillion liters of water every year, but it's also expensive. Your shower is one third of your water bill and one third of your energy bill. I mean, low flow options, they exist, but they force you to compromise on your experience and shampoo is barely washed out of your hair, right? <laughs> People want to live a sustainable lifestyle, but they don't want it to be hard. And we're seeing more and more sustainable tech out there, from electric vehicles to, to smart thermostats, LED lighting, We've interviewed now 400 people and they've affirmed that they do want sustainable products, but they don't want to compromise. The showering industry has been largely undisrupted until this point, and we see showering getting a whole lot smarter. My name is Alicia and I'm the co-founder of the Rainstick Shower. Rainstick is a recirculating shower that saves 80% energy and 80% water, but it feels like a high pressure shower. Our filtration is robust enough to remove bacteria and even viruses. And your shower tracks your savings in real time. Because you're now saving 80% energy and water, you're also saving an upwards of $700 per year. That's an opportunity of savings for Canada that's $10.5 in savings alone. There's 150 million households across North America, each with an average of two showers. And over the next year, there's a, pro a projected 1.4 million household development. Canada has allocated 70 billion to the development of smart cities. And as our cities are getting smarter, our target market, our developers, homeowners, and hotels that are working towards sustainably conscious living, cost savings reduction, and adhering to environmental mandates. I mean, regulations, those are on the rise. If you look at places like Pennsylvania and Santa Monica, they just banned natural gas in new buildings. And BC is now talking about doing the same thing, which is mean water costs are going to increase substantially. We're targeting a price of, of $2,500, and that is an under four year payback period. We're gonna be reaching our consumers through an e-commerce website, bathroom showrooms, and trade show, as, as well as partnerships. And in the future, we're talking about utility rebate programs. Our competition is on the cusp, and they're already receiving multi-million dollar investments from Skype's co-founder, even Tim Cook from Apple. There's two recirculating options here, as well as one extreme low flow mist that was just purchased by Nevia. Our key differentiator is our straightforward installation process, our high pressure experience, and our three year filtration life. The next best is only three months. We have a strong skill set, a combination of science, engineering, and business. Myself, I have a master's in science in climate change and an international business degree. I also spent time living in Kenya, as well as the Netherlands, in water man and spent time working in water management. Sean, he's an energy engineer with over 10 years of water and energy conservation experience. We're also supported by many advisors. We have a functioning prototype at this point we have um, bootstrapped Rainstick to this point, and in the last three weeks, we've just raised 50,000, which is very exciting. <laughs> we also, we have partners. We're working with the City of Vaughan, Walford Hotel, right here in Kitchener-Waterloo, and the Drake Hotel in Toronto. And we're projecting 300,000 over the next 12 months, 1.5 million in revenues over the next 24 months. In year two, we're going to be expanding into the U.S. market, as well as capitalizing on our international pipeline opportunities. And the use of funds from Fierce Founders is going to support our go-to market strategy by helping us certify Rainstick so we can sell into the North American market, uh, helping us set up our small batch manufacturing, and supporting our e-commerce site development. We see a world where we go from linear to circular, from manual 
to smart operation, and to conserving the most precious resource that we have. Climate change is here, and we want you to help us with it by purchasing a shower. <laughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Alicia. That was great. Um, so my first question is, you mentioned a couple partners like the Walper and Drake. Where are you in those contracts? Mm -hmm. Good question. So um, right now I should mention, so we, at this time, we have 21 pre-sold units, okay? Those are for residential. Uh, with our hotel partners, we're working towards, typically they have January and February are their installation periods. And so we're going to be doing our residential installations first and then uh, working with the Walper and the Drake in January and February of 2021. And then my other question would be, are there any other verticals for this filtration system? So uh, that's down the pipeline. So we're really excited about this filtration system uh, specifically, and we're in the process of, um, of patenting it. It actually was originally taken from an in industrial use case and then used for a res residential use. The shower, this is our first product that we're coming out with, but we're very passionate about, you know, the residential water space, and this is only our first product, but there's going to be more in the future. Hi. Hi. Um, I guess my question is on the uh, don't want to give up um, anything to get the value from a consumer point of view. Yeah. What is it about this solution that allows you to reduce the volume of the water so much? Um, do you mind just speaking? Sorry, how do you reduce the volume of the water and not give up consumer satisfaction? Well, I think one of the biggest things is people don't want to compromise on the experience, right? And so they want the same experience, they want the same pressure that they're getting. And so with Rain Stick, the biggest thing is it feels, it looks pretty badass if you look at the, we got our, our, our black, I showed you the black, Batman black is what we're calling it. And so we really are, are, are positioning ourselves to be the Tesla of showers. We want people to go into your shower and say, where did you go and get that? I want one of those. Uh, and so we're making it uh, look very aesthetically pleasing. It's going to look pretty cool, but then at the same time, it feels like a conventional shower. You're not lowering your, your experience from, from purchasing RainStick. As a, as a follow-on to that, um, what is the patent strategy that you have um, that you're thinking about in order to protect this idea? Yeah. The patent world, what we found, there's a lot, you know, and, and our first uh, step for our patent strategy was really uh, interviewing and having conversations with a lot of different people. We've now spoken to a lot of lawyers, patent agents, entrepreneurs, uh, people in this field to understand a little bit more about the process that we should be taking with our patent strategy. Uh, from that, we've looked into trade, trademarks as a first starter. We've also looked into industrial design patents, uh, but we've really been left with the, um, the provisional patent. And that's really where we're, we've decided to focus our efforts, specifically with the uh, filtration component. So we're in the process right now. We're working with an intellectual uh, property company, uh, actually with Erica. She was part of the Fierce Founders cohort in, I think, 2017. Uh, and so she's helping us along our journey. Congratulations on this very innovative product. Uh, I hope someday to buy one. Uh, I have a question just about um, the installation. So you mentioned one of your competitive advantages is very ease of ins installation. Yeah. Can you just describe to us how that works? So is this uh, something that someone could literally someday go into Home Depot, buy and install themselves, or does it require a specialist to come in and do it? How handy are you? That would be my first question. So, I, it, not you very, know, you don't have to but, yeah. but I could so, find someone. Yeah. So we, we've actually gone in and we've we've had a lot of conversations. We've at, gone and sat in, you know, quite a few hours over the last um, six months or so in bathroom showrooms to understand what sort of conversations are happening. We've talked to the salespeople to understand what percentage of people are actually going in and installing their new, um, you know, shower, their new bathtub, like what is that percentage and what's the likelihood that people are actually going to install rain stick on their own? What we found, we have a very straightforward installation. It comes as a system and so it's not like Lego pieces where you're trying to put rain stick together and figure it out. A handy person could absolutely install rain stick on their own. Um, but what we're seeing is realistically it's about 25% of people that will undertake that. The other 75% will go through a professional and we're very confident that a professional can figure it out. For the first installations, we're supporting them and helping them through that pathway. Yeah. 
Can you tell us a little bit about the manufacturing process and the, the cost of production? I know you, you had mentioned that um, the product itself, when it gets to the users, would be about $2,500. Yeah. What is the cost of production? Where would you, man where would you do the manufacturing? Um, all of those components would weigh into how much yeah. money you can make through the, this concept. Okay, definitely. So our list price is $2,500. So if we are selling it um, as is to a residential user, it is $2,500. For, there's two other recirculating options that are out there, 3,200 and 3,500. So even from there, we're considerably less. Um, but uh, so that being said, our margins right now are just under 50%. Uh, and so we understand that we're going to get a lot better. And with economies of scale, it's going to be uh, significantly better. Um, right now, we're going Yes. Yeah. So one of our, our big things is we are, you know, uh, we consider ourselves clean tech, literally clean technology. Um, and so uh, what's really important to us is manufacturing here. We're actually for a small batch manufacturing production. We're working with, um, um, with a manufacturing, it's called the Prototype House. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Alicia. Please welcome Kathleen Chan from Benchwork. I'm Kathleen, co-founder of Benchwork, and we simplify fashion sourcing to save brands and factories thousands of hours every year. Nobody likes paying more for the clothes they buy, but that's the reality today, and it's the reality because sourcing is incredibly inefficient. For a buyer to find a credible factory takes about 12 months and thousands of dollars to vet. On the flip side, for a factory to find customers, it's one of the most manual tasks they have to do. In fact, on average, every week, 25 hours are spent manually searching for customers across 620,000 apparel and jewelry factories globally. That's $11 billion in wasted productivity each year, and we're all paying for it every single time we buy something. So that's what Benchwork solves today. We leverage machine learning to pair brands with the right fit. We take all the nuanced elements that are hard to measure and that what a buyer would, cons uh, would consider, as well as external factors. And we pair brands and get them to the right match. And then once we make that match, we act as the escrow partner to ensure that their run gets from the production floor all the way to their warehouse door. And this is a distinct difference to Benchwork. We're not just another discovery platform. We work deeply with our factory partners to ensure that they get high quality leads time and time again. And we do this in days, not months. So I've said, uh, the right fit a few times, but never in the history of fashion and sourcing has it been more important than now to work with the right partners. The industry is quickly abandoning fast fashion and the factories that make those products for more sustainable options. And global factors like trade wars, vile quarantines, and tariffs mean huge economic losses for brands who can't find new factories fast enough. So as a result, countries have been pouring money into their trade associations, and we're going to be leveraging these trade associations to quickly uh, onboard factories by the thousands. We'll acquire buyers through uh, brokers and direct sales, and every time we make that perfect match, we charge the factory an introductory fee of 10%. Now this 10% is a third of what factories currently pay to acquire a customer. So it means very little to them, but it's worth a lot to us. And it's 10% today because it's about increasing market share and volume. This will continue to increase over time as we get both these things. Now, there's a distinct difference to how we're playing the game. Our competitors want to be the world's phone book for factories, give buyers quantity over quality. But we care about that perfect match, giving buyers value by making the right connection. And so what we're doing is working with brokers like sourcing agents because we know they add a lot of value and they're the informal gatekeepers to millions of brands. And so by working with them, sharing transaction fees with them, and making their jobs easier, faster, and more accurate, we significantly reduce our customer acquisition costs. For a frame of reference, it takes us uh, four, four months to onboard a single buyer, but it takes us four weeks to onboard one sourcing agent representing 10 plus buyers. Agents bring volume. Volume means that we can fill more production lines, win more business, and make better matches with more reliability. Our team is incredibly seasoned. Nathan, my co-founder, super smart guy. He's ex-Oracle, sold his first startup at 23. I myself am ex-Microsoft. At 23, I was the youngest professor at Centennial. And together, three years ago, we started a jewelry brand and grew it from zero to six figures in six months. What this means is we've basically been living in factories for the last little while. 
and we're intimately familiar with the problems that that face every single day. A little over a year ago, we were awarded $100,000 in government grants, and we used that money to develop and launch our MVP in Q4 of last year. Then we took this MVP and worked crazy hard to land a paid pilot with a $2 billion accessories grant. This paid pilot is valued in the mid five to low six figure range. We're also targeting commercialization for later this year. We're here today seeking the $100,000 investment to enable us to target large strategic accounts, accounts that represent brands and buyers that want to work with better factories so that we can hit our 18 month revenue goals in 12. Specifically, the funds will be used for us to product develop and commercialize on the learnings from our pilot, as well as hire a VP of sales so that we can make our sales process a heck of a lot more repeatable. I'm Kathleen, we're Benchwork. We're matchmaking 620,000 factories to over 5 million buyers. We're making the industry $11 billion more efficient, and we're cutting sourcing times down from months to days. Thank you. Thanks so much, Kathleen. Uh, very innovative idea. Thanks. Can you describe a little bit about the risk management uh, in your role? So what risk do you play if it doesn't work out between the buyer and the factory, et cetera? Yeah, How do you protect a, your company? That's a fantastic question. So what I thought we do so too, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what we do right now is we facilitate that introduction, right? What they do after that introduction, what the contract you know, between them, they, that, that liability lies with them. We just act as the escrow <coughs> partner to ensure that the deposits are you know, being paid to the factory um, and the product does end up at their warehouse store. And we've structured it this way because we understand that there's so many nuances and as a small startup, you know, we need to be able to hit um, and manage our risk effectively. And so by making the introduction and making that match, uh, we're not really taking on too much risk. We're just saying, hey, this is your best fit. Based on everything you're looking for, everything you've told us, these guys are gonna deliver what you're saying that you want. How you do that, if you say you suddenly want, you know, X, Y, Z material or, you know, the nuances of that, we leave it to the factory and the buyer. I, I don't have a lot of knowledge um, about okay. this <laughs> space, but what immediately as you're presenting, I, I thought about a space that I do have a lot of experience in, and that, that's ad tech. And I thought about um, this, the advertising chain where we have buyers and sellers of ad inventory and, and then the intermediaries in the middle. And I thought, okay, that's, that's kind of where, where you are. And uh, what is always important along that advertising chain, and I think similarly important here, is the fee model and how you're collecting your rev share, what that model is, um, what type of risk you're taking to the extent that you have a relationship with a buyer who ultimately doesn't pay? Is it based on sequential liability? If you don't, if you don't get paid, then money doesn't flow. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about the, yes. the pricing model? Yeah, so typically when you work with a factory, and I'll, and I'll take it back to this because it's very important. When you do work with a factory, they do require deposits all the time. It's usually 50% upfront. Okay. Right? And the factory right now is taking that risk on themselves. Um, and so as a buyer, technically, if you're sending a check to an unnamed entity. Um, so what we do is we take that deposit, we facilitate the holding and the escrow services of that. Um, and once the product is marked, it's delivered, you know, if there's a defect, um, what's the defect rate? You know, how, what is the, what's the production quality from there? And if they mark off as received and everything is fine, then we do release the second payment. Typically, when it happens, uh, what happens is you get the deposit, but the second final payment is due right before shipment. So, you know, there, you have to literally pay before you're getting your product. Um, they will release it regardless. Um, but we do offer the fact that, you know, there's someone here to say, hey, there's, the defect quality was a little high. You know, we work with them on that, on that model. And every factory is, is a little bit different, but uh, most of them follow a very strategic and very st structured model. Um, I'm concerned a bit about the defensibility over time. Can you talk a bit about how you intend to, you know, maintain your mode and differentiate your over time? Yeah, so right now we're focusing on the discovery aspect and we recognize that there's quite a fair bit you can do in the supply chain model when it comes to production. Um, so what we're doing right now is focusing on the discovery aspect and down the line we have features to focus on uh, other production processes that are involved when making a product. So whether it's project management features, whether it's um, you know, deeper kind of payment features, we're able to kind of integrate further into this supply chain so that it becomes very hard for a factory to switch out. But right now, it's about making that right fit. Because once you get them at the beginning where they trust you and they're saying, hey, these guys are delivering great customers that are long-term, they're doing it over and over again, um, 
you know, I'm going to trust the product management features that they are building. I'm going to trust adopting, you know, their kind of processes. And that's how we're planning on doing that. Thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. Next, please welcome Rosa Hoffman from MedsCures. Well, thank you everyone for being here. I am honored to be on this stage. My name is Rosa Hoffman and I am the CEO and founder of MedsCures. Last year, this beautiful little girl named Gabby, who was two years old and she lived right here in Kitchener, she accessed her mother's opioids and she unfortunately passed away from the situation. This is happening every day around the globe and it was a huge reason why I decided to start MedsCures. You may not be aware of this, but Canada is the second largest consumers of opioids in the world, right behind the USA. The financial burden that Canada and the US see for misuse of opioids is over $80 billion in one year. And in 2018, they prescribed over 200 million opioids. So the controversy with opioids is that they're very dangerous and they're highly addictive. However, we still need them. So the solution here is not to get rid of opioids, but to find a smart, secure way to manage this medication remotely. My company is dedicated to intelligently securing all medication at a pharmacy level. Now to start, we are focusing on opioids and psychiatric medicine, but we will be going after the entire marketplace because we believe all medication is dangerous. Our solution to this entire epidemic is pill trail. We've developed a proprietary, secure, smart bottle that only dispenses medication according to a patient's requisition. Our business structure is very similar to that of an HP printer. We are subscription-based, and our network depends on our proprietary bottle inserts. We are patent-pending, we're 100% reusable, our refills are just under a dollar, and our bottle alone is $18, which is not a lot when you think about the fact that it can save a life. So how it works is really simple. You as a patient will take your requisition to your pharmacy. The pharmacist will then access our backend system and program that bottle to dispense according to your requisition. Patients do have an option to download an, a mobile app, which allows them to keep notes at a doctor's appointment, add alerts and reminders, add caregivers, and also provide real human data in regards to the medicine that they're actually taking. You twist the cap and your pill is released. We have a huge potential market. However, we're gonna be focusing on governments, pharmaceuticals, pharmacies, and addiction centers to start. Our sales projections for 2020 is to complete our MVP and be in market by Q3. We're currently in discussions with a few addiction centers to pilot with their methadone program. We're projecting 100,000 uh, bottles sold by the end of this year, giving us a revenue of over $1.9 million. In 2021 to 2022, that's a big year. We want to go to US. We want to launch our blister bottles and our marijuana bottles. By 2023, we want to be securing all medication, not just opioids. We want to be utilizing our human data to better how medication is made. We're projecting 30 million bottles, giving us a revenue of over five, I'm sorry, $500 million. So by 2024, we want to go global. Now, above and beyond our bottle sales, we do have a software fee and we do have our insert sales. So based on the numbers I just shared with you, you're looking at another $230 million a year. Now I get that these numbers seem really high, however, we're still under 20% of the entire market. My team consists of Smart, SmartWave, which is an engineering and manufacturer firm out in Toronto. They're very, very well versed in a lot of medical devices. They also built the dispensaries for uh, the Purell hand sanitizers. So if you used it, you've used my team. My advisory board are all industry insiders, including Laura Wayland, who is the president of the Ontario College of Pharmacists and also the owner and operator of a few shopper drug marks. Between my team and I, we have validated this pro pro product with 
many people, and everyone's come back and said that this product and program may be the only real solution to a major global crisis. We don't really have any competitors in the space. Piltru is the only company going to the pharmacy and securing medication before a patient gets it. Up until now, Medscures has been 100% bootstrapped by myself, and I'm looking for smart money to take this vision to the next level. This $100,000 is going to help us complete our MVP and get us into our pilot. It is estimated that every person will have at least one opioid prescription in their lifetime. Medscures has the potential to become a multi-billion dollar service and data company. We ask for you to join us in the venture of making medicine safer. Thank you. So that I understand, um, the, you would sell, your customers would be pharmacies? Correct. Is that right? Correct. Okay. And who is controlling the release of dosages? Pharmacies. The pharmacies. Okay. Um, what, I guess I, coming from a legal background, I'm trying to, to pinpoint risk and liability. If something happens um, to a person who has been prescribed opioids, um, they overdose, um, which is you know, obviously it's uh, such an extreme likelihood. Um, who takes on that risk and how do you protect yourself from that risk? Absolutely, so we, we are working with lawyers who are helping us through that process right now. So I can't give you all the, the information behind it, but what I can tell you is what we have done is we do know that in terms of not accessing an opioid, you wouldn't die from the pain. So the chances yeah. of actually being able to get into that bottle, you can still I'm break them, but we monitor it. Is there a way to uh, transfer that risk to the pharmacy? I think that's kind of where my head is at, whether you can transfer that risk to the pharmacy who's actually controlling the dosage and, and um, I'm not sure, or whether it, there needs to be any type of certifications that you need to obtain um, in order to be able to absolve yourself of that I, risk. I get what you're saying, and it's a fantastic question. Yeah. I cannot fully answer it sure. to the best of my knowledge, but it is definitely something we are working on. Understood. Yep. Uh, very innovative idea to solve a problem that's Thank you. absolutely real. Um, I work at a bank, and we, uh, our people rely on technology all the time to serve our clients. And when technology doesn't work, we hear about it, and they need help instantaneously. I'm putting myself in the shoes of the pharmacist, and all of a sudden the software is not working, or they're new, et cetera. What's the tech support? Because they need to program this device to then dispense and give to the customer, like how, how do they get the help if they can't figure out what's going on? So SmartWave does have a team of over 250 employees. So they are my engineering firm. So to roll out, they will be part of that first training session, but we are gonna ramp up an internal team that's also gonna help promote and keep you know, customer service coming in and out. So we will have a team of trainers that will help that process. Um, and there'll be a, a way for them to get that help even if they're not in front of them? Like Absolutely, okay. yeah, online. Everything will also be online. What is the mechanism of the bottle? I can't go into too much detail because we are we are patent pending. Um, I can tell you on, on terms, it's, it is LO, it, IOT, sorry, so we are connecting to cellular for opioid bottles. Uh, otherwise, I, I can't really go into too many other details <clears throat> about it. Without the specifics, it has a battery? It has it a battery. To a network? Correct. LTE or cell, I'm yep, assuming? Yep, correct. Uh, it has a battery, connects to a network. We do have a board as well on, on the entire system. We've got wires. Yeah. The maintenance would be the responsibility of the pharmacy, like batteries, taking the bottles back, giving new bottles out. Correct. So we, we are a USB, so you, you can actually recharge the batteries when they are returned. The bottles, sorry. Um, you mentioned in discussions for pilots, which is, is very vague. So can you give me more depth into where you're at with that sales cycle? Sure. So uh, through Laura, we are actually working to get the pilot programs going through Shoppers Drug Mart. So they are launching the methadone program with addiction centers. And what we're doing is we're securing the um, methadone in our bottles. At this point, what they're waiting for is to see the next MVP so that we can go live with them. And what's the time frame? Uh, about six months to have this MVP completed. Okay. And then you are the only co-founder, right? Correct. Um, so how do you intend to grow the team? 
oh, I'm, I'm looking for a really good amount of team. Right now, I'm, I'm working with professionals to get this product done properly from the gate out. And then the goal is to, to really vamp up that team and bring on a CTO, a CFO, and, and sales and marketing. So one last question, if we have time. I think um, abusers of opioids are probably not going to want to use this type of mechanism. So I'm wondering, what is the thought process on, in terms of, are we, are we trying to um, right, ensure that it has, like a doctor will prescribe this, but it can only be used if it's used with this mechanism? Correct. So right now, there is a narcotic system in Ontario. If you get a narcotic, you need to leave your driver's ID on it. And that's how you can get it. If you can't get it otherwise, we are talking to the government about hopefully partnering and using our bottles to be part of that program. So it would be mandatory. It would be great if um, if you could have access to or somehow integrate um, being able to analyze data where you can identify uh, a fact pattern of usage that makes someone a bit more vulnerable and in those circumstances, maybe that's discriminatory, but in those circumstances, this is mandated? Yeah, absolutely. Does this make you a medical device? It doesn't. So in a pharmacy, you don't actually have to be FDA approved. You just have to follow the criteria of a bottle. Thank you. Thank you, Rosa. Next, please welcome Min Pham from Vital Home Care. Two members of my family got sick at the same time and needed help. My parents struggled to find adequate support for my aunt and grandma. The stress our family went through was immense. Unfortunately, my story is not unique. Across the world, people are living longer with more chronic illness, but there's a shortage of caregivers because there are problems in the industry. This has led to billions of public dollars wasted on preventable health care and emotional pain for families struggling to find solutions. When I saw my parents go through all this, I thought there had to be a better way. Hello, everyone. My name is Min, and I'm the founder of Vital Home Care. Vital Home Care has developed an app to connect caregivers to people in need of care. We make matching and transacting super easy. When a loved one gets sick, it's not something you plan for. It happens fast, and you need help right away but it has to be someone qualified, close by, and available when you need them. Also, compatibility, language, cultural sensitivity are especially important. On the other end, for caregivers, their hours are extremely fragmented. They work at locations all across the city, so they can't optimize their time to make enough money. On top of this, they often contend with late payments. This has led to a mass exodus of care workers from the industry, a huge strain on those left, and a shortage of qualified workers for those in need. We've discovered that the current solutions of long lists of unvetted caregivers that families have to try and navigate is horribly inefficient and a huge headache. So our algorithm gives users a list of qualified caregivers that are available close by and meets basic language and gender requirements. If there is no one caregiver who has all the availability needs, the system will suggest a combination of caregivers that collectively would. For caregivers, they'll only be sent applicable requests. They can set their hours, work close by, and never worry about a late payment again. Our revenue model is simple. We charge $22 to $29 an hour. Our take rate is 20%, and there are no fees for the caregiver. The home making and personal service industry in North America is $6.6 .6 billion. In Canada, it's 248 million. Our take rate being 20% means that Toronto represents a $7.9 million opportunity. The industry is fragmented with no dominant players. We can look at them as groups of different offerings. Of our direct competition, like other online marketplaces, we are the only solution to utilize a data-driven matching algorithm to optimize interaction success. We are also the only solution to offer fully vetted, interviewed, certified personal support workers that are insured, all at an upfront low cost. Thus far, we validated market need by measuring the number of users on existing platforms. We went through a robust testing process and identified the three problems of location, availability, and compatibility. So that's what we designed our solution to solve. Next, we'll conduct customer acquisition channel validation. 
When we launch in Toronto, we'll acquire the supply side first as it's cheaper and easier to do. To acquire the client side, we'll double down on the channels identified in our tests. We'll use Toronto to refine our launch process so we can use it again and again when we grow to other cities in Canada and eventually globally. We've bootstrapped to date, we have early revenue, and we're seeking 100,000 to complete channel validation and execute on our launch. We did some early experiments with paid search and found that the cap for the client side was about 200 and LTV was about four. We will conduct A-B tests, both within online paid search and also across offline channels and find meaningful data to optimize customer acquisition, which will get the cap down over time. We're already turning caregivers away due to our small client pool, but as we expand and onboard more caregivers, our LTV will increase because the more caregivers we have, the higher the client retention. With the 100K investment, we are confident that in a year's time, we'll be able to achieve a CAC of 100 and LTV of eight. With a projected week-over-week -week revenue growth of 3% in year one and five in year two, and our plans to expand to two additional cities in year two, here's a look at our customer and revenue growth over time. Our amazing team is a group of experienced professionals who are passionate about our mission because we've each had our own struggles of caring for our loved one. We are also actively seeking for an industry advisor. To achieve a revenue target of 500K by year two, we'll use 10% of the funds towards tech maintenance, 15 towards supporting our users as we onboard them, and 75 towards sales and marketing. I am excited to share this story and journey with you all. Join me in helping to alleviate the stress of care. Thank you. I'll go first. Um, so you said you're looking for an industry advisor. Have you had anyone involved up to this point? Um, I've had a few advisory sessions with um, some advisors from Mars in Toronto, but nobody, like in a, nobody in an official capacity. Because you had mentioned your team was a you know, professional, experienced. How many years of experience does your team have? Yeah, so, so, um, so we have a, Tarun is our tech advisor. Julie is our designer, and she works at um, Scotia Bank Digital Factory. Um, and then we have Khaled, who is the uh, digital marketer at Zensurance, or he was. Yeah, I was looking for a bit of a breakdown in terms of years, but um, can you also tell me some examples of the channels for customer acquisition that you were referring to? Yeah. So we found that when, when home care needs arise, it arises abruptly, uh, typically after like a hospitalization or such. So the number one place that people go to find solutions is online. So we'll, we'll be focusing on optimizing um, intent-based search. What that means is Google Ads. Uh, so basically A-B testing, um, you know, like ad copy and um, like k keywords and such, but also offline channels. So um, we're exploring referral programs and affiliate programs with other se uh, related senior service providers such as professional, uh, professional downsizers and senior accredited re uh, real estate agents. Uh, we also have an internal referral program where you know, there's a share code and then if you refer a, a, friend, um, a, a friend, then they get a free hour, you get a free hour type of thing. And also we want to explore um, community and uh, community fairs and senior uh, trade shows and fairs. I would circulate that with an industry expert on you know, online advertising for this particular space. Um, I may have missed it, uh, so I understand the differentiation around the algorithm and the data matching. Yes. Um, but can you just describe a little bit more about the quality of the caregivers that you're accepting into your platform? Because there certainly have been some horror stories um, over the last couple of years about folks that have may have misled care.com, et cetera. Is it that it's a, an interview that your team conducts before they're allowed to get on the platform? I just didn't follow that. Yeah, piece. that's okay. So, um, so basically all our caregivers, uh, we vet them. So we check their um, ID, that they have a valid and up-to-date um, criminal background and vulnerable sector check, as well as an up-to-date first aid um, CPR and first aid certification, and that their certification for PSW is from an, um, an accredited and recognized institution in Ontario. Um, the interview is done online. So basically, they are sent a link, and then they have to uh, complete the interview, and then that interview um, is reviewed later by the team. This sound. Uh, a few components of this um, make me think about privacy regulation. One, when we're talking about um, advertising, 
um, presumably some ad targeting, um, and where you're collecting personal information of on online users, um, in particular medical information. And so I'm just interested um, the the compliance with privacy laws today it can be a, a wild ride and inter interested in what strategy you have around privacy compliance at this point. Yeah, so um, we do have documentation that the client shares with the caregiver in terms of what needs to be done for the day mm -hmm. um, and specific tasks. They are PSWs um, so that they, they can't really operate outside of the scope of practice um, and do like un but acts that are deemed regulated. With that being said, the information that is shared on our platform is not typically health related, but that is uh, a possibility if that is shared like inadvertently. Um, so I am speaking with um, like tech advisors and um, the privacy officer you know, in Ontario to figure out the kinks around that. Yeah, I think my suggestion on that, that component would be the sooner you can have your uh, privacy strategy um, set up and try and build your tech around that um, as opposed to uncovering some of those issues later and then having to go back and, and make those adjustments to your tech, that, that tends to be more efficient and cost effective. I was just doing a search in Toronto for providers that sound like you. Mm -hmm. um, how do you differentiate again? I see at least six that are actively online advertising. Yeah, so, so our, key, our key differentiator is that our matching is super efficient. So uh, when you join other platforms, typically they just give you a slew of, of caregivers or a slew of um, clients that are you know, in your city. What we do is we um, match them based, we suggest a match specifically based on the days and times requested. So basically, let's say you are asking for uh, Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays at this time, that time, this time. Instead of you having to, to scroll through and message you know, a bunch of caregivers and trying to find out what their availability is, like where they are, are they gonna come to you, et cetera, we literally um, suggest these caregivers are available Mondays, these caregivers are available, t available Tuesdays, these caregivers are available Fridays, and, 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 and also at the times, at the correct times. So, um, yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Thanks. Next, next, please welcome Julie Lajeune from Wish and Give. My name is Julie Lejeune, and I founded Wish and Give. Wish and Give is an invitation for the invitation platform. Think Evite with a social conscience. But Wish and Give is so much more. Wishing, I'm growing the next, sorry. How are we doing this? I'm, I'm leveraging kids' innate passion and sense of community, whether it's helping the polar bears or the homeless. I created a platform for them to use their birthday parties to give back. By sending out their party invitations through wishandgive.ca, their guests are asked to contribute to a group gift and a donation to charity in lieu of individual gifts. The birthday kid still gets a gift and, this, and, and a donation to charity. This allows them to put their passion into action. Wish and Give solves a few problems for busy parents. When your kids are of school age, there are a lot of birthday parties. I currently have three on my calendar. By using Wish and Give for their invitation, Parents are saving time. No more wasting hours shopping for a birthday gift. It's also eco-friendly. No more wrapping paper, ribbons, or plastic toys. And with a donation, I'm helping everyone feel good about giving back. And science has proven that it feels good to give. I'm also helping small charities with much needed fundraising dollars. For example, one charity in, in downtown Toronto, I helped them make payroll that month by the donation they received. Let me walk you through how we can raise one million for charity in the next couple of years. There are about 400,000 children in Toronto alone, age zero to 14. Assuming just 5% have a birthday party, that would be 20,000 parties a year, or, five, or 400 parties per week on average. And this is very likely a very low assumption. To date, we have hosted 270 parties and raised four, over 41,000 for charity by, by small five, 10, $15 increments which equals an average of $152 per event for charity. We believe we can capture 5% of the weekly parties by year end, raising $158,000 for charity this year. And again, this was a, with a very small proportion of the Toronto parties. 
The way we'll capture 5% of the birthday parties in Toronto alone is through face-to-face -face marketing, social media ads, and referrals from each party. On average, there are 10 guests per party. To date, 19% of our customers have found us through social media and word of mouth, even one in Kelowna. As a website, we are not limited to Toronto alone. We believe Toronto represents 25% of the Canadian market. As we scale across Canada, we can raise 632,000 for charity by year end. And this sets us up to dominate the Canadian market and grow by at least two times in 2021 and raise 1.2 million for charity. How will we reach the rest of Canada? This is possible through a strategic digital marketing plan, including upgrades to the current beta version, user experience in testing, strategic SEO, and investing in social media ads to name a few, as well as automating the back end of the website for streamlined processing of payments to the host and charity. While it's incredible to raise 1.2 million for charity, what is Wish and Gives revenue? From our 270 events to date, our average revenue is $43 per party. Following the above calculations, our net revenue for 2020 is expected to be 180,000, reaching 1.4 million by 2023, depicted in the blue line. To date, I have invested 50,000 personally with another 10,000 from friends and family. Continuing on this path, we would reach 300,000 by 20, 2023, in the yellow line. 100,000 from fierce founders would allow us to scale faster. The funds would allow us to make the necessary website upgrades, scale our digital marketing campaign, and ultimately support our amazing Canadian grassroots charities that make our communities, cities, provinces, and country a better place to live. How is Wish and Give different than our competitors? We have all 86,000 charities on our website, and we do not charge monthly membership fees. We want all charities in Canada to have access to this type of funding. And compared to Evite, the kid still gets the birthday gift. It's their birthday after all. Why am I the one to make this successful? I have over 20 years of experience in the charity sector with both, both big and small charities. I also, also have a great advisory team alongside me with Corey with over 20 years of, of web development experience, Michelle with over 20 years in communications, and my husband Eric as the MBA behind the business. Wish and Give is poised to scale and grow. Every Canadian family has access to it. And it's not just for birthday parties. We can do any event. We are here to help raise the next generation of givers and support all charities across Canada. I invite you, and I invite you to join me. Thank you. Uh, so I have been, as a mother of small children, I've received yep. one of your competitors' um, invitations. So I was just trying to understand a little bit about how it was different. You just described yep. it there. Just so I'm clear, to the user, to the parent that's organizing the party, the main differentiator is there's more charities that they can choose to give to, and also they don't pay a monthly membership fee to you, which they're doing at other... Right, so the main differentiating factor for the party host is that I have all 86,000 charities on the website, and you can search by postal code to find a charity near you. So I'm helping people to dis discover the women's shelter or the food bank down the street. The main differentiating factor for the party guest is that the, I put the power in the guest hands to choose how much they give to the gift and to the donation. It's not a 50-50 split. So the, the revenue model here would be a percentage of what you've generated for the charities. Um, how many charities do you have onboarded at the moment? So I've uploaded the CRA list of all 86,000 plus charities in Canada okay. onto the website. Okay, uh, but are they active? Can, do you need to have an agreement in nope. place? They don't need okay. to. It's, it's kind of like a virtual lemonade stand. We're okay. fundraising for them okay. and I send the funds to the charity. And, the, and you're retaining a portion of that product. Correct. Okay. Okay. Um, technically, this could work for any invites, right? Exactly. So Anytime you, you would send an evite, you could use us. So do you have specific you have other verticals that you're looking at, like weddings, even funerals? Anything. Yes. Yeah, so I'm actually having a really good success right now. We've tested out teacher gifts for a classroom. So you can send up an, set up an invitation, send it out to the classroom parents, all the parents can click through their credit card, contribute to the gift. Teacher gets cash, that's what they want. I had a teacher tell me she doesn't drink alcohol or coffee, so she has a stack of gift cards she can't use. So we're doing well in that. I'm also doing a March break charity challenge right now, suggesting kids set a personal goal, 
and set up an invitation to basically ask sponsors to sponsor them. They earn a prize from the gift and a donation and by you know, reading 10 books over March break or something like that. So, yeah. And have you looked into any B2B models for this? Because you're very consumer focused right now. Um, I haven't as yet. I've, cons I've had mentors tell me I could white label this and, and talk to the Chuck E. Cheese's types of the world. So I would like to explore that area because right now I am B2C. So how does this relate to some organizations like Canada Helps? Is the main differentiator that you integrate tightly into the invitation so you get closer to the consumer? No. So Canada Helps, is they're an umbrella type charity organization themselves that does the tax receipting and online donations for small charities. I'm a, on the board of a small charity. We use them for our tax receipting and our online donations. They also do birthday parties, but um, the differentiating factor is for mine is that the kid still gets a gift. So the, the guest is contributing to the donation and the gift, and then I pay out the parent in cash so the kid can buy theater tickets, or like my daughter's birthday party is next week and she wants a guitar. So the cash that I pay myself, I guess I'm the party host, will go towards her guitar. And then it helps with cutting down the, the amount of stuff, quote unquote, at home as well, because if you're inviting 20, or like my daughter's inviting 13 kids to a party, she can't get her list down, and so I don't really want to have 13 boxes of stuff or stuffies and my house, so. Yes. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Next, please welcome Atape Zarabadi from Artificial Intelligence Imaging Sensors. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Atefe, and I'm CEO of AimSense. This man is Hugh. He suffered from a stroke, and by the time he reached to the nearest hospital with the CT scanning facilities in Yellowknife, he was found to be brain dead. Hugh is not alone, and early diagnosis of a stroke is not only an issue for remote and underserved communities. A stroke is one of the leading causes of death in the world and number one reason of disability in Canada, and we believe this must change. There are two types of stroke. Ischemic, that happens as a result of a cl clot blocking a blood vessel, and hemorrhagic, due to a bleeding. Over 85% of strokes are ischemic, and they can be treated within a time window of four and a half hours by injecting a clot dissolving drug. Our solution is to bring the diagnosis close to the symptom onset. The electromagnetic brain scanner can fit into an ambulance and send to the patient for on-site imaging. The brain images sent to the radiologist. After the diagnosis, if it is ischemic, the drug would be administered. If it is hemorrhagic, the patient would be transferred to a comprehensive stroke care center directly for a surgery. When the blood penetrates into the brain tissue, it changes its properties, and that's what the electromagnetic scanner detects. So far, we have done the computer simulations for the brain modeling and the design of the antenna arrays for the proof of concept. Currently, the conventional Imaging modalities such as CT and MR are very well established and advanced. However, they're expensive and stationary. AIM sense scanner are offered at one tenth of the price. It is safe, portable, and easy to operate. A socioeconomic burden of $200 billion associated with the stroke is imposed on the society every year. And this can be prevented. Or, or calculation for the serviceable addressable market shows $7.3 billion market opportunity in North America. We know that there is a need for this product as we have already received letters of intent from 
a radiologist and neuroscientist for research purposes and from uh, an emergency doctor. So far we have accomplished the discovery phase and we are working on development of the prototype and doing the preclinical studies over the next two years. And we are planning to launch the product in 2025 after getting the FDA approvals. Based on the roadmap, we have some rough estimation for the cash flow. In 2024, we're gonna start generating revenue for research market, and in, by 2027, we will have our FDA approvals and we would establish a, a strategic partnership with large companies such as GE, and there we start our real growth. Our next milestone is developing the first prototype that will definitely unlock a lot of opportunities. So far, we have secured 110K for, through the grants, and with the Fierce Founder Fund, we will be able to finish it faster, twice faster, in nine months rather than 18 months. This is a multidisciplinary venture, and AIMSense brings scientists and engineers from different backgrounds together to make it happen. All our team members have over a decade of experience in different areas from medical imaging to signal processing hardware and software. Our team is supported by technical advisors. We are doing the preclinical test at the Stroke Research Lab at University of Waterloo. We are closely working with medical physicists at Grand River Hospital for safety and regulatory compliance, and we have access to well-equipped antenna and microwave labs at Georgian College. In a nutshell, this technology would save lives and cut the stroke-related costs significantly. We have accomplished the, the discovery phase, and this investment would enable us to achieve our goals faster. Thank you. So I'd say for me, um, as soon as you say the prototype is going to be developed over the next two years, you scare away a lot of investors. So do you have any models by which you would increase that speed? Yeah, actually the prototype would be developed uh, over the next nine months if we enter the engine program, which is a government program that we have already uh, passed the initial screening project. And by that, we will be uh, matched with the industrial partner that it would help us for the industrial design and it, it will accelerate the, so it's basically some kind of matching funds and it will accelerate the development of the prototype. Thank you. Do you have any examples of similar companies and the overall cost from the stage you're at now to get to market, like how much additional money you would need between now and regulatory approval? So your question is how long does it take to get the approval? And no, it's how much money are you going to need between now and then. Okay, yeah, basically this, um, the medical device is not a <laughs> cheap journey, but uh, it takes a lot of money. But um, for the, um, uh, for the preclinical and for the clinical tests, they are different. For the clinicals, we're going to need somewhere between 10 to 20 million dollars. But, uh, and it's going to take between three to four years. and. According to uh, the regulatory that is, uh, like the, we are classified as class two medical device, and for the radiation, it is kind of safe. So the regulatory path compared to some other medical devices is, uh, is not as complicated, but still it needs a lot of money and time to get there. The, the concept is really exciting. Um, I think we all, it seems that we have similar questions, and I think they arise from uh, seeing, you know, the 2025 regulatory re approval, and it seems, and, and this is just, you know, goes along with the medical industry and, and you know, you take for granted that um, hopefully it will uh, receive the regulatory approval that it, it requires. How do you make 
give yourself the best chance of receiving that regulatory approval? Are there government um, relationships that you need to work on between now and then? I guess I just see there being a lot of risk to expending a lot of time and resources and getting to this 2025. Uh, just interested in that process. Yeah, actually that is uh, an important thing that we are uh, aware of it. And that's why we started just uh, like building relationship with the regulatory um, agents and getting uh, input from medical physicists who are working with the radiation and they're giving us advice on in terms of like how it should be patient friendly, how it should be like um, in terms of reading the uh, images, it should be easy for the radiologists. And we, we are getting a lot of feedbacks and we don't, without that, we won't be able to build the tech and it, 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 it will not be possible. That's right. So getting the feedback along the way so that it, it's, you know that it's aligned with what the regulatory requirements yeah, are. Yeah, that's, mm -hmm. that's right. And like along, like um, beside the advisory uh, team that we have, we also thinking about getting some person in that is expert in regulation because we know the importance of it. I applaud your uh, passion to solve this problem. Uh, one question I had, there are other medical devices, as you mentioned, in hospitals produced by very big companies. Do you have any concerns that they're also working on something very similar from a portability perspective and will be first to market? Uh, this is a very promising technology. And over the past decade, uh, startups and companies started to working on this electromagnetic brain imaging. We do not have a commercialized product in the market yet, but there are companies that have started like several years before us and they are ahead of us. And we have some indirect competitors as well. As I said, the CT and MR, they are also developing some mobile stroke units, but unfortunately they are not successful. There are only a handful of them in the world and that's because it is not financially viable. They are putting the big CT scanners into the big trucks and send it to, even, even building that uh, ambulance is uh, cost like uh, over $1 million and the maintenance for the next years even increase that amount. So we see uh, our position somewhere between the like direct and indirect competitors and we try to catch up with the direct ones, <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Arafay. Thank you. Next, please welcome Rachel Bartholomew from High Ivy Health. Hello, everyone. My name is Rachel Bartholomew, and I'm the founder of High Ivy Health. Imagine you're a 28 year old female and you've just been diagnosed with cervical cancer. You discover that you're gonna need treatment and surgery that's directly gonna impact your sex life for the rest of your life. And as you start these treatments, you start experiencing multiple symptoms, especially during sexual activity, including pain, bleeding, and discomfort, just to name a few. So you start your research and you realize that these symptoms are similar across multiple diseases and treatments, including pelvic-based cancers, reproductive disorders, and surgeries to the pelvic area. So you reach out for help and you realize you aren't alone. One in three women will have some sort of pelvic floor dysfunction in their lifetime, directly impacting their ability to have safe and comfortable sex. And as these women start to share their experiences, 60% of them have a fear and anxiety towards sex after treatment and diagnosis. 85% of them were seeking alternative rehab treatments, and 75% of them had a loss of desire after treatment, diagnosis, and surgery. What these women need is a safe, trustworthy, and comforting set of products at a time they're most fearful and vulnerable. This is why we created High Ivy Health. We create sexual rehab products for women with pelvic-based cancers and diseases to help improve and keep track of sexual recovery after treatment, diagnosis, or surgery. Here's the product. Our first product is a connected modular vaginal wand that has eight different sensors and five mechanical functions to help a woman rehab from the comfort of her own home. 
We use features such as autodilation, ultrasound, self-relubrication, and hot and cold therapy to help with symptom management during rehab and sexual activity. All of the sensors work together to help monitor and track progress of the rehab in real time. We're the only device on the market that has a number of different features to help with a number of different symptoms. We're fully customizable based on your treatment regime. We involve the doctor in the process of setting up a treatment regime on the device. And we're the only device on the market that converts to pleasure after rehab is complete. <laughs> Woo! We sell our base device for $350, as well as optional modular add-ons for your specific treatment. We also have a subscription for extra data, as well as a subscription monthly for lubrication pod packs that are custom to the device. We sell into the femtech and sexual wellness industries, targeting 43 million women with pelvic-based diseases in North America. And this does not include women who have experienced childbirth or menopause. With a 1% market share, that's almost half a million women's lives that we hope to change. Our go-to-market strategy is to first go to market direct to consumer with a pre-sales on Kickstarter and then go online to the novelty market. We want to use those revenues to help fund our clinical trial strategy as well as our FDA clearance to sell into the healthcare market to doctors and therapists under a brand new brand name. And we have the right medical team in place to help execute this strategy. We have 10 reputable and respected medical professionals in their field helping us with product design as well as medical research. We are a team of seasoned entrepreneurs, engineers, and scientists from University of Waterloo and McMaster, and we're currently hiring for me mechanical, software, and technical leads. So if any of you are in the audience, please come talk to me later. And we work fast. We have our first prototype complete. We've been accepted into a number of programs in the US and Canada. We've opened our New York office and we're working with regulators. We've also completed our bill of materials and now we're working on quotes for manufacturers. And this year, our goal is to file our provisional patent, get our product ready for scale manufacturing and raise a significant seed round. The 100K from Fierce Founders would be critical for us to help us hire our two female engineers from the University of Waterloo that we just gave offers to, to help us get us a high fidelity product for manufacturing so that we can help design our provision, get our designs for our provisional patents. I wanna finish off with a story today. Remember that girl who I talked about at the beginning of my pitch who was recently diagnosed? That woman was me. I was diagnosed with cervical cancer this past May and through my treatment, my radiation, my surgery, and now menopause, unfortunately, I'm creating this product not only for myself, but for the thousands of women who I encounter every day who are struggling with their relationships, their sex life, and just having basic pelvic exams from their, doc their doctors. Pelvic cancers and diseases suck, I know this personally, but your sex life doesn't have to. Thank you. <laughs> So yeah, very interesting product. Um, so I would ask more about your B2B strategy. Yeah. Um, can you dive into that a bit deeper in terms of like how you're structuring each of your new customers? Yeah, so our, our B2B strategy is really to sell to gynecologists as well as pelvic floor therapists. And the goal there is to essentially use medical sales and just go door to door to essentially uh, find those people, both in North, in, mostly in North America. Uh, what we're hoping to do is have the uh, gynecologist actually prescribe the product uh, and get it covered under insurance and then have pelvic floor therapists actually use it in their practice as well as uh, allow women to take it home, use it at home, and then continue on that therapeutic process. Uh, thank you for sharing your story, Rachel. Thank you. Um, and a very innovative product. I guess the one question I had, uh, just can you describe a little bit more? I was very intrigued by uh, how you mentioned the doctor actually programs the treatment on the device. Can yeah. you explain that in a little bit more depth? Yeah, for sure. So uh, when you've been diagnosed with any sort of reproductive disorder or a cancer, 
Uh, part of the treatment process uh, is you actually go into the doctor's office, uh, you work with the doctor to set up a treatment plan. Uh, our hopes is to actually integrate that into that process so that the prescription is done, you have that treatment plan in place, and then you can take that home and what the device does on the uh, mobile device is you actually set up the um, number of times that you need to do the treatment process uh, that the doctor had prescribed and then you're able to go and do it. Really it's just for setting notifications so that you're consistently doing your therapy. Um, I have a question. Uh, you had mentioned New York offices and I was just interested in that strategy and why the presence in New York, it's um, notoriously a very expensive oh, yeah. um, place to have an office. Yeah. Um, so why and yeah. the go forward strategy of where your your headquarter presence will be. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So we were actually accepted into an advanced manufacturing lab there, so that's why we're placed there. Excellent. So actually free office space, which is great. <laughs> that's great. Um, and there's also a huge femtech and sexual wellness movement happening there, so already kind of exploring that, and some of the big sex toy companies are actually there as well. Mm -hmm. What I'm hoping to do is slowly move back towards the border. Uh, so we've been working with Fuse Hub, which is in Albany, um, and they do a lot of scale manufacturing support uh, in, in an accelerator. So slowly move back to Canada and end up back here. That's great. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. And last but certainly not least, I'd like to welcome Shui Li of Salutech. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Shui, and I would like to introduce you to Salutech, where we are using conductive biomaterials for treating atrial fibrillation. So what is atrial fibrillation? It is when the upper chambers of the heart, the atria, are beating erratically and irregularly. As such, they're not able to properly pump blood from the atria into the ventricles and into the rest of the body. And this is a serious and growing epidemic, with over 33 million people affected worldwide and growing rapidly with aging populations. Patients experience a decreased quality of life ultimately leading to death. When we look at treatments available, they are focused on symptom management and complications. The key thing is the standard of care does not represent a cure. And that's what we're trying to do here at Sally Tech. We are developing a conductive biomaterial that treats the underlying conduction issues of atrial fibrillation by creating a bridge for these natural healthy signals to move through, ultimately leading to a healthier heart. So our solution is marrying conductive polymers, which were novel but incompatible with the human body, with an organic biomaterial, creating a conductive biomaterial that could be used within the body. There are three unique aspects about our technology. First, we're able to make it so it's evenly distributed, and this is what allows for smooth electrical propagation. Second, there are multiple future indications in key cardiovascular areas. Most uniquely is our ability to match the speed of healthy heart tissue. So too fast or too slow, and you can actually cause more heart issues. And we've proven this out using a long-term small animal study where we are following the bright red line, you see an immediate drop in atrial fibrillation as soon as we implant our conductive biomaterial, while the control group continues to experience atrial fibrillation. And we have set ourselves up with a strong foundation for future success, with two patents and being fortunate enough to have developed and continue to develop this using $4.6 million in non-diluted research grants in addition to closing our pre-seed round of 400,000 last summer. Addition, equally important, is having validation by the scientific community with five peer review uh, papers in journals by our CSO. As mentioned earlier, the competitive landscape are filled with treatments that are focused on complications and symptom management. 
we provide a comprehensive solution based on the key decision-making criteria of our target atrial fibrillation population. And zoning in on the two treatments most similar to ours, we see them to be lucrative and high growth markets. So how do we get there? There's really five steps from us, from animal validation to human validation, to how to get it into the body, to making sure that we're getting paid for and getting the support of key cardiologists and cardiovascular groups. We're also de-risking this process by having a Health Canada meeting that's already scheduled for April. Given the time for clinical trials, we will be able to show uh, strong efficacy for our product, from which we hope to become the new standard of care, from which to grow our revenues with our strong cash flow margins. We have a de dedicated team working on this project with diverse backgrounds and skill sets. We've also been fortunate enough to build, uh, to have such strong advisors from an end user expert perspective cardiologists, cardiovascular surgeons, and atrial fibrillation experts, as well as ex executives from key industry leaders. We've also been fortunate enough to have the support of wonderful startup programs, including Fierce Founders, which is why we're here today. As we've started to look to raise our seed round, there are two steps that investors really want to see. First, they want us to work towards the minimally invasive delivery device for our conductive biomaterial. Second, as we get closer and closer to human trials, they want us to also have a clinical trial manager. However, if you give us the funding, we're able to stretch it out because we are using it for R&D basis. From there, the extra 35,000 can be used towards a part-time engineer as well as continuing our patent coverage, which we need as we look to disrupt atrial fibrillation treatment using our novel conductive biomaterials. So thank you very much, and I will now open the floor to questions. Thanks so much. So you'll run into a lot of the same issues as Onsense in terms of time and money. Yeah. And so what are some additional de-risking solutions and activities that you have? Mm -hmm. And I think for us, patients are the most important from a foremost perspective. So we don't want to cut steps from a clinical trial perspective. We want to make sure we're going through all three phases to ensure the safety and efficacy of our product. But what's great is that the regulatory agencies have avenues for these novel technologies to come to market a little faster. And that's by cutting the administrative time between each step of the process. So with the US FDA, there is the breakthrough device designation. And as such, we would shorten any of the administrative periods between the clinical trials. Additionally, we've already had regulatory consultants tell us that we're a great candidate for this uh, avenue. Hi. Hi. Um, are there, I don't know this industry at all, um, are there large uh, medical providers who would be better positioned to deliver this product to market that would be interested in doing that mm -hmm. either with you or in some other way? Yes. So uh, the industry has changed quite a bit over the last 20 years. About 20 years ago, they were very acquisitive using uh, with just requiring preclinical such as large animal studies. However, what they've done now is almost use startups as like an outsourced researching platform for them to see really, really innovative technology, let it get de-risked to the point where there's strong human data to show safety and efficacy before they're willing to do an acquisition or a co-development opportunity. That being said, we've already talked to three of the five key players in this space to understand what their needs and what they're looking for and how we could potentially work together in the future. Some of the roles that you had mentioned looking, that you're looking at, it's a very niche area, it requires um, lots of expertise. Where do you find that talent mm -hmm. and by what means? Yeah. So I think we've been very fortunate to have our pre-seed funding and that's given us so much uh, access to kind of subject matter expertise. So we've been able to have great uh, we are currently working out of Boston where there's such a strong healthcare market and focus. So we've had local regulatory uh, consultants, we've had reimbursement consultants, as well as a lot of ex-industry people who have done their career in Boston and have chosen to stay there who've given us great mentorship over time. 
And we've also uh, have had our team, so our CSO has been at UHN, which is the hospital system in Toronto, for almost 30 years. So specifically within the division of cardiovascular surgery. So that being said, we have a strong network of uh, really, really strong um, cardiovascular experts that we can draw upon for next steps. You described the cost to get to earning revenue. Can you describe a little bit more around, assuming there's regulatory approval, um, the revenue model once you're actually allowed to have humans use this, is it not, it's not going to be cost prohibitive to the hospitals? Like, can mm -hmm. you just describe a little bit of, more about the revenue model and the cost of yes. goods? So there's kind of two avenues. Once, uh, what happens with a lot of technologies like ours, where it's very parallel to current technologies, as soon as you kind of get to phase three or strong human studies or starting to sell revenue, they usually get acquired. So that's one avenue we could go. But with regards to the revenue model, we have a very low cost of goods sold. And understanding that the reimbursement system in the US is very structured and understanding that process and landscape a little better, we have quite a large margin that we can work with and provide a more effective treatment, which is what we're also focused on. So with regards to the treatments that I had mentioned, catheter ablation and maze surgery, they're both looking at reoccurrence rates of 20 to 50%. So we could do that more effectively. Thank you so much. Well, I don't know about you, but I do not envy these judges. This is gonna be a really difficult decision. So thank you to the finalists. A great job done by all of you. Let's give them one more round of applause. So at this time, we're going to excuse the judges for deliberations. It is now my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker today, Alexandra McCalla. Alex is a graduate from our Fierce Founders Boot Camp, and last year she took home the $100,000 prize. Please welcome COO and co founder of Air Matrix, Alex McCalla. Our daily lives move fast, but faster has left us overcrowded. Congestion slows down the things we really need and brings up the things we don't. Our roads need a break and the answer is up. Drones are becoming a major transport system. Within five years, there will be millions of drone flights per day around the world. We're at a similar place with drones as we were at the start of the 20th century with cars. So the next step is to build the roads. Air Matrix is that infrastructure technology. In the same way city planners use grid systems to build surface laneways and traffic management systems, Air Matrix gives enterprises and governments a layered grid system by building millimeter precise highways in the sky. This precision enables safe navigation through dense environments, while algorithms manage intersections and provide optimal 3D routes. Traffic control operators can easily monitor and manage the entire system remotely from a simple to use application. There are positive environmental, economic and societal impacts too. A new transport system alleviates road congestion, leading to less air pollution, faster and better access to emergency services, and efficient city transit. With proper infrastructure, we can prioritize time-sensitive medical emergencies like organ delivery, have faster first responses to fire and crime, and provide safe and quick delivery services for goods and people. In addition, Air Matrix gives local governments a new economic engine, enabling toll collection and thus creating a brand new revenue stream for them. Imagine, instead of worrying about the hordes of drones that are coming, Air Matrix can help your city create order out of the oncoming chaos. To learn more, contact us at info at airmatrix.ca. Our journey tomorrow starts by building the roads today. Hi, 
everyone. Well, that's Air Matrix, and I'm so happy to be up on this stage a year later with minus 20 million the amount of nerves that I did last time. I could spend the next little while that we have together talking about how Air Matrix is providing their roads to deliver lungs downtown, working with the government here in Canada, the US, and Australia on drone policy regulation, commercialization, and enabling enterprises and cities to safely commercialize drone and usage in cities. But instead, I want to answer some of the questions that I get asked a lot. How did you get into this? Drones, like, I, how do you even think of this? How did you be, be, become a part of Air Matrix? And how are you going about building this company? Well, how I became a part of Air Matrix really started about four years ago. I'd recently been promoted in a high-powered management consultancy firm where I was focused on tech strategy and operations. And I was interviewing for my dream job, content strategy at Netflix. I had done a bizarre double major in economics and cinema studies in university and worked in tech and media up until that point. Finally, my resume made sense to someone going across from me. And long story short, nine or so interviews later over two months, with many panic attacks in between, you know, read, having seven 50-page documents sent to me on the Friday for intense case interviews on the Monday, I ended up in LA on the final round. So I'm there and I'm crushing it with these VPs and these intense case interviews and brain teasers and they're loving me and I'm winning them over. So after three hours of that, I go directly into an Excel test. They had only told me about it the night before so I didn't have time to prep, but alas, I did it. And as I left the LA office in, uh, the Netflix LA office and looked up at the Hollywood sign, I started crying and bawling with just filled with gratitude. I knew everything was about to change. Then I didn't get it. But what was more surprising is I wasn't that upset. This was gonna be my dream job. This was gonna be the big tick on the check mark of life that would validate my existence. But you know, I, I, had a, I basically had a breakdown in the middle of the Excel test and something that I've done a million times I couldn't do. But over the past year, I realized I didn't want to be validated by this external thing. I'd seen behind the curtain and it wasn't gonna fulfill this internal feeling of completeness. I'm the type of person who will write something down when I've already done it just to cross it off so I could feel validated on my to-do list. But this was not it. So I switched slowly, slowly through a personal journey over the next year and a half from wanting something with so much external brand value, social capital, into something that's inherently valueless, a startup in drone technology with a couple of co-founders who met in university and have fallen in love with the space because they see that our air, our air, not Amazon or Google's air, is gonna be revolutionized. And so I started building. And I could talk about the different business lessons I've learned along the way and I still have to learn and they have so much value. But what I continually met at every step along this journey was myself. That was the biggest challenge at every single step along the journey, whether it was having a near seizure when I'm doing a brand new task or having to learn something brand new, or you know, just almost avoiding an Excel file with complete procrastination because of panic, being toxic towards my co-founders, and even finding the reason to keep going when there was apparently no fruits of my labor. I learned pretty quickly that if I was gonna do this whole co-founder entrepreneurship thing, I needed to face myself. I was not going to be successful, let alone sustainable at this, if I didn't really, really face myself to fix these continual things that kept coming up. And so around mid last year, I started that journey. I got some help. I got a coach and various other methods, which I'd be happy to talk to about afterwards. And here's my confession. I'm a sensitive, emotional person. 
I would not have imagined, no way, saying that on this stage a year ago. No matter how many Harvard Business Review studies and articles I've read or people have forwarded me on empathy being a key driver in, in excellent leaders, no matter how many friends and mentors telling me that that is my skip, that is my asset, I don't believe it. I don't. Right at the core of me, I don't. You see, I never saw my mom cry. I was raised in a single parent household where my mom sacrificed and fought so hard to build an amazing career for herself whilst also building me along the way. Don't get me wrong, she was a lot of fun and had a lot of joy and never asked me to be anything else other than I am. But I equated her strength and resilience with good and my emotions and my sensitivity with bad. So, I'd ask you, how did I get here? Well, I started to reject and reimagine what was the true value that I wanted to be validated by. As I fell in love with the drone industry, I realized I wanted to build value. I wanted to build value from something that's inherently valueless. And isn't that all why we're kind of subconsciously here today as founders or tangent to the startup ecosystem? We're attracted to this. We're attracted to taking nothing and building from it. But how can we do that without truly acknowledging what's inherently in our value? If we want to build, we've got to understand what the roots are. We love to acknowledge the beautiful flower that we put out in front of everyone, like these beautiful, amazing pictures today. But if we're really going to build and be business leaders, we've got to acknowledge the dirty parts the roots underneath that provide our foundation and take, and take advantage of those. So I ask you, as we all go back to building from buildless, from valueless, whether that's with a 100K prize or not as founders, or in our various different projects, I ask you, let's face ourselves and let's find our true value. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. It takes a lot to show that kind of vulnerability to a crowd, so I appreciate that. I think there's something we can all learn from what you shared today, so thank you very much. I appreciate you being so open and sharing your story with us. As the judges continue to deliberate, I wanted to make an exciting announcement. As I'm sure a good deal of those folks that are in this room know, the Fierce Founders is a long-standing brand here at Communitech. Fierce Founders has been delivering both a boot camp and an accelerator over the past several years. These programs, which wouldn't have been possible without the incredible support of our past and present sponsors, have helped hundreds of female founders on their entrepreneurship journey. We've taken some time to really look at the benefits offered by past Fierce Founder programs and gather feedback from its participants. As a result, we have made the decision to continue to run our boot camp and replace our accelerator with something that has more impact. I am proud to share that starting today, interested female entrepreneurs can apply to be a part of Communitech's Fierce Founders Intensive Track. Now, with the additional support from federal and provincial governments, as well as our partners at BDC and Google, we're adding new services to Fierce Founders. Some might say we're innovating. <laughs> what makes this new offering different from the Fierce Founders Accelerator that you've all come to know and love? The Fierce Founders Intensive Track will offer participants the opportunity to work with a team of growth coaches to develop as well as execute on a customized growth plan to help expedite the trajectory of their company. Focused growth coaching sounds great, right? Yeah. Well, there will be even more. These com the companies that have the strongest growth plans will qualify to receive matching funds of either $50,000 or $100,000 to help ensure, yes, <laughs> thank you, 
to help ensure that their businesses have the best possible resources for optimal growth. We are so excited to expand our support of women-led companies through this new offer. For more information about how to apply and who qualifies and all of that good stuff, uh, please just visit our website. You'll find all of that information there. So I see that our judges have not yet returned. I'm pretty sure I'm supposed to like cue tap dancing or dad jokes or something. I think it's a, it's a very big decision. So we ask them to make that decision in a matter of 15 minutes, which is pretty tight timing. I do expect they will be back though super, super soon, maybe like five minutes. So I would encourage you to stay in your seats. That would be the best way to do this. That will make me smile the most if you all stay where you are. However, if someone needs to have a restroom visit that's super quick and get back to their seat, that is also fine. I just don't want you to miss the exciting news of who's the winning company. So I encourage you to stay sitting. If you need to go pee, you can do that. But please be back no later than five minutes from now. I hear that the decision has been made, so please make your way back to your seat. I'll be making the announcement in under two minutes.
Okay, everybody sit down, please. I am gonna take this brief minute before we hand over the check to do a couple things. First of all, I wanna thank everyone who's watching online. I know you're there because my son just texts me and says, you're awesome. So, <laughs> hi guys. Also, I'd like to thank my team. These kinds of programs don't come together without a lot of thought, effort, time and consideration. So everything from the events team that puts on all of this, the marketing team that works behind the scenes, but primarily to the programs team that delivers on the execution, planning and delivery, all of the growth coaches that are involved uh, and all of the, the folks that organize the event. If you could give them each a round of, or all of them a round of applause to show your gratitude. Okay, we have two winners. Yes. <laughs> yes, if anyone wants to make a donation, please feel free to do that so that we can continue this in the future. Um, so first up, second place prize goes to Rachel Bartholomew from <laughs> High Ivy Health. Rachel will receive a check for $25,000. And the first place prize, da da da, for $75,000 goes to Alicia McFetridge from Rainstick. Congratulations. Congratulations, ladies. <laughs> to the audience, thank you for joining us today. Both those of you who are here in person and those of you who joined us online, we hope that you'll be able to stay a while longer and help us celebrate. Thank you again to our partners, BDC, Google for Startups, the province of Ontario, and the Government of Canada. I'd like to ask the winning pitchers to please come up, uh, as well as the eight finalists, to stay on stage so you can have your pictures taken with our partners and our judges. Thank you and enjoy your evening. Woo!